people ask why, why, why do you do this? And uh, people don't realize what those 18, 20 year old kids did. World War II, which is, you know, by far the most changing event of, of the 20th century, uh, is, is three pages, four pages in a history book now. You know, no mention of air power. I can only imagine being a, like I said, an 18 or 20 year old kid taken off out of Tinian and Saipan that they couldn't find it on a map if they, you know, probably still can't find it on a map. They, they would fly four, five, six hours up to Japan, you know. It's that old adage of you know, hours of sheer boredom followed by, you know, minutes of excruciating terror. You know, want to honor them, honor the women who stayed behind, built the airplanes. Pretty amazing what that generation did. Somewhere in time I was about 12 years old, I decided that, that I wanted to be a pilot. No one in my family was a pilot, never flew on an airplane, but I heard that pilots have a pretty easy life and a pretty cool life. So from the time I was 12, I decided that um, I found out that if you went to the Air Force Academy, they'd send you off to pilot training for free, and free was really good. So uh, being the oldest of five kids, so uh, um, turned 18, graduated high school, and we got an appointment to the Air Force Academy in the class of 1984. Guess what? You don't fly airplanes at the Air Force Academy. So I got one helicopter ride, was my actual first airplane ride ever. Your senior year, you get to fly a Cessna 172 for about 20 hours. And what that is, that's sort of a lead-in uh, flight training program so that you can, uh, they can make sure you can follow a checklist and learn the, learn the Air Force way. So I completed my 20 hours and soloed and waited another year to go to pilot training. So the summer of uh, 1984, I went to Enid, Oklahoma and, and flew T-37s and T-38s and after a year of flying and about 200 hours, I graduated and uh, went on to fly Lear jets for the Air Force, which is called a C-21. You joined the Air Force to see the world, so my first assignment, of course, was uh, four miles from where I grew up at off at Air Force Base, but love the airplane, the responsibility, they'd give a 25-year-old first lieutenant and a 23-year-old uh, second lieutenant, a brand new Learjet, a government gas card, a piece of paper telling you where to go and say, bring it back when you're done. The job was designed to age pilot, get experience on young pilots so they could go into the Air Force and do, do certain things. And the Air Force was flying the C-5 and they needed to bring people in that actually had some real world experience and you can't really learn on a C-5. You know, it, it's, it's too expensive to learn on that. So we're learning in the Learjets. Did that until 1988. Um, Shuffle, the Air Force gives me a new assignment and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I went to uh, fly the B-1 bomber at Dias Air Force Base in Texas. I was sort of an odd duck in the B-1 because they had a lot of young guys that had no experience. The older guys went on to be aircraft commanders. Well, I show up, I have 1,500 hours of flying time but, the, uh, but I hadn't dropped bombs, so they made me a co-pilot. When I started the B-1, it was purely a nuclear airplane. So about the first three or four years, we were out there flying 400 feet in the middle of the night at midnight through the mountains. Started out practice flying nuclear missions, which you know is one bomb at a time. And then uh, by 91, 92, after the first Gulf War, they made the B-1 conventional and nuclear. They had a little different tactics on both of them, so training-wise, uh, the conventional missions were pretty cool. The B-1 had the capability where it could s actively select how many bombs you drop. You could, could, you could drop one bomb, or you could drop all 84 bombs. So you could select how far they spaced out on the ground, so there was a lot of training to do that. Our biggest place to drop bombs was out in Utah, so you know, every time you got to go out there and do a live drop in Utah, that was, that was pretty cool. About, about an hour and a half flight, you'd hit the tanker, you'd fly low level for an hour, and you'd end up on the Great Salt 
flats out there and there's a bombing range. And go around, drop three or four times on there. and they, They'd score you. I mean, you got scored on every bomb. You had a bad bomb, when you came back, you sort of had to justify to the boss why, why your bombing wasn't good that day. Luckily, it didn't happen very often, but every now and then it did. We do Red Flag, which is out in the Las Vegas range, and uh, it was basically a mini war. There'd be bad guys out there trying to get you from coming to the target. There'd be good guys trying to protect you. They would actually push airplanes out in front of you to shoot the radars, and we'd come into the range from 500 miles away at 0.9 Mach, and no one ever saw us coming. And, that's how we would fight. After 14 and a half years, I separated from the Air Force, but I swore right into the National Guard the next day and went to Lincoln, Nebraska and flew uh, the KC-135 for nine years. KC-135 was a wonderful airplane. Everybody thinks, oh, you're just up there giving gas to somebody else. But you think about it, who's the last person to see the fighter or the bomber before it goes into combat? It's the tanker. And if the tanker's not there, they can't go do their job. So it's a very important job. In the tanker, combat's a little different. There were basically six airplanes a day. They'd fly down to Afghanistan, do four hours on station. It was about a two hour flight down, four hours on station. We refueled everything from, from the AWACS, which is the big you know, eye in the sky with the big dome on top to B-52s and B-1s. They would have a B-1 orbiting over Afghanistan 24 hours a day. If some army guys on the ground uh, having, a, having a bad day, they would call him and B-1 goes over and drops a bomb to, to, to help them out. And if it's not a B-1, it may be two F-16s. And so um, knowing the fact is that we're supporting that warfighter uh, ended up being a really total force way to support the military. My last deployment, I actually deployed about 45 days before I retired. Found out after the fact I wasn't supposed to go. Um, you're not supposed to, I was getting ready to retire and um, phone rings, I answered the phone and they said, hey, we're looking to see if anybody wants to go uh, over to uh, the Middle East for uh, about four weeks. You know, one of those things, substitute somebody's wife's having a baby or something. And I said, well, I'll go. And so uh, I was a lieutenant colonel getting ready to retire. And I was very excited because, you know, it was a more, another chance to go over and fly some combat missions, see the real world. And like I said, I was, I was going to retire in a month and a half anyhow. So it worked out as a uh, pretty neat thing. So... Yes, the B-29 is everything you've been promised. And the pilot who flies one has an enviable job. Important, glamorous, and tough. Here's a B-29 pilot. General Doolittle stole my title to my book. It's called, I Could Never Be So Lucky Again. Um, 2016, B-29 DOC was coming off of its 16-year restoration. Once again, right place, right time. But he says, hey, you, you're the kind of guy that could get time off and wants to fly the B-29. So they, were, they needed a couple pilots. I got the phone call and they asked if I'd come fly DOC. And so since 2016, I've been flying DOC. You look at what General Doolittle did. He was an amazing man. So you don't need to say everybody knows about the Doolittle raid, but uh, set speed records, did amazing things like that. And I don't consider myself in, uh, in that realm, you know, setting records and all that. But I was an Iowa farm boy, never flew an airplane. Went on, flew, was an instructor pilot in four different airplanes in the Air Force. Flown some very unique airplanes, like I said, the, uh, the B-29 with only two flying out of 4,000 built. Uh, once again, like I said, I can never be so lucky again. Between Fifi and Doc, I have about 700 hours of B-29 time. Oddly enough, about 320, 30 hours in Fifi and 350, 60 hours in Doc. So I've flown both aircraft significantly. There's eight B-29 pilots right now. Um, I'm the high time B-29 pilot. I kept track and there's a couple of us that sort of know who's flying what when, but uh, there's eight of us that are left seat qualified and I have the most flying time of the eight. I get offers to fly other airplanes, uh, B-25s especially, but uh, uh, there's, there's several B-25s out there. And 
I've decided that I want to be, I want to be the guy that's more an expert in one airplane than the guy that goes out and flies five different airplanes a day. I'd rather be, quote unquote, the expert of the B-29s. People ask why, why, why do you do this? And uh, you know, we want to honor the men who flew these airplanes. People don't realize um, what those 18, 20 year old kids did. You know, went off to war, so. One more 1,500 mile haul up and down the ruddy Pacific. 15 hours, 7,000 gallons, four engines, 11 guys. A water jump across 20 degrees of the globe. A continent of ocean. Destination, Tokyo. World War II, which is, you know, by far the most changing event of, of the 20th century, uh, is, is three pages, four pages in a history book now. You know, no mention of air power. I mean, it was air power that started World War II with the Blitzkrieg and the Germans, and um, air power was ended in World War II by bombing of the German industrial complex and, and bombing of Japan. So air power is, you know, very, very important. It's not even mentioned. I can only imagine being a 18 or 20 year old kid taken off out of Tinian and Saipan that they couldn't find it on a map that they, you know, probably still can't find on a map. They, they would fly four, five, six hours up to Japan. You know, it's that old adage of, you know, hours of sheer boredom followed by, you know, minutes of excruciating terror. Level, four, five, especially for those gentlemen who flew them during war. The airplane's a time machine. We were in Florida and uh, had a 92-year-old B-29 navigator, and he came out and he sat in his seat, and right next to him was his 60-year-old son. And uh, so we take off, he's out going for a ride with us. And, you know, sir, you can get up and you can walk around the airplane. He says, son, I have uh, thousands of hours pacing around this airplane. He says, I, I'm happy right here, this is my duty station. But every time I looked at him, he was turning around telling his son um, something, just whispering to him, this is this. And, uh, you know, something triggers something in your mind. And he kept saying, oh, remind me to tell you about this, or remind me to tell you about Joe and that. And, and like I said, it just, it just took him back. I, uh, so I tell everybody that, you know, that these planes are time machines. The history of this aircraft from 45 to 56, it served in with the uh, with the Air Force. And then in 1956, it was a group of airplanes that actually was given to the Navy to be range markers. So this actual airframe sat in the desert out in California for 44 years. Our group got uh, control of the aircraft, broke it into seven big pieces, and trucked it on flatbed trailers from California to Wichita. And then a dedicated group of volunteers spent the next uh, 16 years restoring the aircraft and about 400,000 man hours. And uh, what you see is now a, a beautiful airplane that's definitely better than it was originally built in 1945. There were six test flights in 2016. Um, I flew three of the six test flights. The first test flight lasted all of six minutes. Then I got to fly the next test flight. We flew about 45 minutes. It was basically a new airplane. Even though the airplane at the time was 70 years old, it was a new aircraft. B-29 was a significant improvement over the B-17. B-17s flew in the 20,000 foot range, carried you know, up to six or 7,000 pounds of bomb. This aircraft carried 20,000 pounds of bomb, could fly up to 30,000 feet and about 3,000 miles. The aircraft is 141 feet wide with a 99 feet long. So it's also significantly larger than the uh, B-17s and B-24s of its day. Every now and then people look at the aircraft, they ask why it's not painted. Paint weighs a lot. So by not painting the aircraft, they save thousands of pounds of weight. So that's thousands of pounds of bombs or thousands of pounds of fuel that you can carry and fly farther. This is the forward bomb bay. The aft bomb bay is identical to it and we show people to give them an idea of how big the bombs are. This smaller bomb would be a 250 pound bomb. The bomb above it is a 500 pound bomb. They can carry 20 of those in this bomb bay and another 20 in the aft bomb bay. So 40 of those 500 pound bombs. 
And then on this side, this is a casing for a thousand pound bomb to give you an idea on that. If you envision 10,000 pounds of weapons being put in here, so. This is the forward flight deck of the B-29. In the old days, they had a crew of 10. They had two pilots, a bombardier, a radio operator, so a flight engineer, and a navigator. So six up front, and then another four in the back, four or five. It was usually four gunners in the back. Later on, they had an airborne radar operator. Nowadays, when we fly the B-29, we have at least six. Three in the front, you got two pilots and a flight engineer. Three scanners in the back. They tell me if the engine's on fire or smoke, tell me my landing gear's down, my flaps are down. And then I have another scanner that's in the aft compartment, and so we fly with six crew members now. I, I just love telling the story of, of the B-29. Yeah, I get to fly the airplane. That's sort of cool too. But, but uh, you know, we need to tell that story. We you know, kids today need to understand why things that happened 80 years ago is important to remember and to honor.